Okay, so in the remaining part of the lecture today, I would like in to look into geometric transformation bet transformations between images. So what we have seen so far mainly be geometric transformation between images in the sense of a shift. So we have one image and a second image, and one image is shifted with respect, for example, to the x or to the y coordinate to the other image. So we have one image or an image template, and we shift it a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right hand side. So this is a transformation between an image, which is the shift. But of course, they are kind of also more general transformations, so we make into, take into account um, uh, a rotation as well. We may take into account the fine transformations um, or other type of also nonlinear transformations. We may need to take. We, we may need to consider when describing how one image can be transformed into another image. What I want to look, what we want to look into here today is what kind of image transformations do we have? What are certain properties, and what are things I need to take care of if I transform one image into another image? But first of all, let's check why this makes sense, or why might we be interested in transformation between images? So one of the things is rectification, or the um, Bildentzerrung. In German, um, this is a process that I have an image, which is due to the um, perspective projection of the camera. It is kind of we've seen it's distorted. What I want to do is I want to kind of mat this back so that it better reflects reality. So what you have here, for example, is an aerial image which is corrected in a specific way that I can actually take measurement in those images. So that the distance over here corresponds to the same distance over here and maps to a certain distance in reality. And I may want to do that by taking a non-rectified image, which has a distortion based on the projection of my camera, and I want to rectify the image so that, for example, the geometry corresponds to a certain geometry. So I, for example, assume that this is a plane on the ground, so the ground is flat, and then I can actually map the image on this flat ground. And I need that, for example, in order to correct images, or if I want to make measurements in those images. In this case, it's a special kind of image, it's an autophoto on, on the creation of autophotos. It's a little bit more involved than just that, but this is a first step in this direction. I may also be interested in the process the other way around. So I have a rectified image, and I may want to warp it onto some other object. This is something which is very frequently used, for example, in the creation of animated movies, where I have a texture, for example, the skin of a dinosaur, assuming that it's a perfect flat skin. But now I know that I have a 3D model of this dinosaur, for example, from Jurassic Park, um, and where the dinosaur has a certain shape or is kind of seen in a certain way from the camera. So I need to um, render the local texture based on the image that I have and kind of need to project it onto the dinosaur in order to get a realistic image. You know, this is the, the mapping the other way around. So, I can, so both things make sense for me to rectify an image but also to do what is also called texture mapping um, to map that onto another image. And there are different kind of transformation, translation, Euclidean transformation, similarity transform, where I also change the scale, affine transformations where parallel lines still remain parallel or I have my um, projective transformation where just lines um, stay, stay lines. So if these different types of transformations how I can transform one image into another image. Or I have kind of two unrectified images and I want to align those images. This is also what's called registration or alignment and this is for example just as a fun application if you kind of morph two faces into each other. So you want to transform both images so that they match and that the certain shape of a face in this example is for example maintained. So you can kind of generate an alignment of those two images. These are just examples why we may be interested in geometric transformations. Um, other examples are for example for mosaicing if I have a large number of images and I want to generate a large mosaic of those images and want to stitch those images together this also um, under these, uh, under, in this case I can actually use techniques like this. But we want to now start with general geometric transfer transformation between images. So we have coordinates, can be either i, j, if I'm only working in my integer world, or um, if I'm working with 
um, real numbers, then we may take the, um, the coordinates x and y. And I have an image A and I have an image B in the lecture here. And image A has an own coordinate frame SA and image B has an own coordinate frame SB. What I typically want to do is I want to I have an input image, for example, B. I want to transform it in a way to obtain image A. The question is, what is the transformation between that? So in order to kind of be a bit more clear in which coordinate frame we are always in, you kind of see this index here on the top left of the vectors. And this tells me if I'm in A or in B at the moment. So this is the x coordinate and the y coordinate of this 2D point expressed in A and as part of expressed in B. Okay? So we have this kind of notation. We can now describe a transformation which transforms from one image into, or from one system into another system. We can write this here as T with one index here on the bottom right and one on the top left. And this we can read this as transform from B to A. So from the coordinate system of B, I transform into the coordinate system of A. And I kind of write it in that way because if I chain up multiple transformation, I always can check Thus, we have, for example, a transformation T, which maps from A to B, and we have a transformation, whatever, F, which maps from F to A. I can always check, are those values the same? If this is the case, I'm all fine. Then the result here would be a new transformation, whatever, A, which maps from F to B. But if those are not the same, it would be A and B, I know that I made a mistake. Therefore, this notation is actually kind of useful. So what this tells me is I transform, start with an image B, I do the transformation, it transforms me there to a new system which corresponds to my image A. So the mapping between B and A, from B to A. From B to A, that's how we read that here. So I have this transformation which maps from B to A, and can also write in that way. Of course, we could also do it exactly in the same way the other way around, map from A to B with a new transformation, in this case T prime, which maps from A to B. Of course, depending on the type of transformation that I have, it is invertible or may not be invertible. But for now, we assume that those uh, are here are uh, invertible. Sometimes, so if you kind of write this, um, in a non-bold phase, then this can also refer to the dimension, so the x dimension and the y dimension, because we are living here. We have a, may have a transformation x and a transformation y. So don't get that confused. Then this way, we may mapping from P to A, is just one index is here, it means the dimension, so the, dimension, the transformation in y and the transformation in x. Okay? Okay, how does such a transformation look like? For example, if we find transformation, we can express this transformation also through a matrix, a two by two matrix, plus a shift we have over here. So we have six components, which maps from B to A over here. Okay? So if those elements, if H11 and H22 are both one, and H21 and H12 are zero, then this is just a simple shift. Exactly the same way we have done that before. Okay. Okay, now just put an example in here. So I put in 0 0.25, 0 0.25 over here, and 10, 10 over here. Just as an example, how one of those transformations may look like. So what is this transformation actually doing? Can you see what this transformation is doing? Yeah? It's uh, shrinking images and at the same time also shifting it. Yeah, so we are first shrinking our image to a quarter of its original size, and then we shift it by 10 pixels in the x and by 10 pixels in the y direction. Okay? Okay. Now let's transform one point, let's say the point one one from our input image. So let's assume those two values is 
uh, both one and do this transformation. So we can write that down as our transformation, 0 0.25, 0 0.25 here, 1, 1 is my input, and 10, 10 here. So this ends up to be into those values over here. And now we have the problem if I kind of want to generate, let's say I want to generate this image, output image A from my input image B given a transformation. The problem that I have is that I actually end up getting coordinates here which are not integers anymore, integer values anymore. So what to do? What should we do? So I said I want to generate an image A which has a quarter of the size of the original image B and it's shifted by 10 pixels in X and in y, in y direction. That is my constraint to you and I give you the input image B and I want to have, I want you to provide me this image A. So what, should, what do we need to do if we have such a problem? What can we do? I could do that depending on the values I actually put in here. I may find no pixels because I never end up exactly at an integer value. But there's something just close to what you said which I could do. So that's one thing. I can simply compute, as you correctly said, the mean. In the simplest case, I could just take one of those values, but I could also average over those values. Or take the one which is closest to my coordinate, and then simply round, if I had whatever f, 10.1 and 10.2, simply round that, round that to 10.10. It's the easiest way I can do it. And this process is a process which is also called re is a resampling. So I do the transformation. Um, if, if my transformation leads to non-integer coordinates of my output image, I need to do something, and this step is called resampling. Even if both map to integer coordinates again, for example, if I scale up my image with a size of 2, I would have actually missing pixels in between. So. I may also do that to interpolate or even to extrapolate two new values. Let's start with the most simplest way of resampling, which we just, as we said before, we just do a rounding operation. So we compute the transformation for all pixels, and then we just select the pixel which is closest to the coordinate that I want to have. So if, my, if I want to have the coordinate for 10, 10, and I have due to my transformation 10.25 and 10.1, and this is the closest one, I just take this value. So what this will end up being is, what I just do is, this is my, uh, the, the image that I have is just kind of the rounded operation of the other image. So if these are the, the black spots here are the points for which I have this, when I compute the color information, just kind of this colors just for an illustration, and I want to compute the intensity values in the, everywhere in the middle, I would actually get this shape. So if I compute this value over here, what, this is the closest one gets blue, blue, from here, I end up at cyan. So it's just an, a crisp assignment to the closest point that I have. This may not be optimal, maybe suboptimal. The question is, can we actually do better? Can we do better than just taking the pixel which is closest to the pixel coordinate that I want to have? What could we do? We could compute the mean of my neighboring points. So I can take whatever three neighbors, four neighbors, two neighbors, five neighbors, how many I want, and I can compute the mean. One thing I can do. But now consider the points are spread actually quite far away. Um, or differently far away, so just computing the mean may not be the optimal thing to do. What is kind of close to just using the mean, which may take also into account the distance from the point for which I want to compute that to the individual points. So I can compute a weighted mean, for example. 
And something which I'm going to present now is very similar to that. It's called bilinear interpolation, or in German, bilineare interpolation, which allows me from a couple of points, in our example four, compute an intensity or a color value for um, any point lying between those four pixels. So consider, I know the intensity value of this point, of this point, of this point, and of this point. So I have, in this case, four intensity values. And now I want to compute for every point in this uh, square, I want to compute a color value, and the color value is given by a weighted mean between those points, basically trading off how far am I away from the individual pixels. So if I know this is kind of the 2D view, kind of the top view, so kind of I know this point, I know this point, I know this point, I know this point, and now for every point here in the space, here we just show the example for this point P, we actually want to have a color value. How we can actually view that, we can view that actually in 3D, where the intensity value is kind of, can be represented at the height. And then the thing in 3D looks something like this. So I have my four intensity values. These are my pixel points down here. So this value is a high intensity value, low intensity value, slightly higher, and they are probably quite similar in this example. So and then what I basically want to get is actually this surface over here. So if I have, when pick any point P here, this should be the intensity value. OK? Kind of clear what we want to do? What we describe now is how we actually obtain this intensity value. OK. So we have our points delta x, 0 means simply how far am I away from 0 in the x and in the y dimension. And then I can simply say any point in here can be expressed as the four intensity values times the distance in x and y from this intensity value from the pixel for which I know it. Simply write this down like this. And then I have my interpolation scheme. So these are these, co these coefficients A are simply the intensity values at those four locations. And the delta x simply means how far am I away from the zero point in the x and in the y dimension. OK, now I can simply reformulate this. So group all the elements which depend on delta x, all the elements which depends on delta y, and the elements depend on the product delta x, delta y. And then I kind of have other coefficients here. So the, those four elements here, element 1, element 2, element 3, and element 4, um, are now again constants. constants. So I can actually write this as coefficient c00, c10, c01, c11. And if I do it, with the, write it with these coefficients, I can actually express this interpolation scheme as a, as a sum of the four the elements i and j ranging in this case from 0 to 1. Then I have my coefficient delta x to the power of i and delta y to the power of j. And in this, in using this interpolation scheme, I directly obtain a way for computing those intensity values. Any questions about this kind of procedure? So if I now say, OK, this was my yellow value, this was my blue value, my dark blue, my red, my another red, cyan, and blue value, so exactly the same example I had before for the nearest neighbor approach, I can now interpolate between those colors. So in this rectangle over here, I'm interpolating between yellow, yellow, blue, and red. And this is the color distribution that I get. Here, interpolating between red, cyan, blue, and yellow, and this is the color distribution that I actually get. Okay? It looks kind of, it doesn't look super smooth, especially in the, along the overlapping areas, but it looks much better than our nearest neighbor interpolation. So kind of, for example, here along this line connecting those two points, because I'd use different values for the interpolation, it doesn't look very smooth. The shape of um, the borders over here. So they say, mm, maybe I want to improve that and not just taking into account my four neighbors. 
maybe I want to take more values into account and then not just use a straight line for the interpolation, but maybe I want to use, for example, a spline to do that, or a cubic spline. And this leads me then to the so-called bicubal interpolation or a bicubish interpolation. But the process itself is extremely similar to what I've done before. The only thing I'm doing now is I'm not taking into account only four values. I take 16 values into account. So if I want to compute for any value in here, an intensity value, I simply take 16 values around into account. So for any value in here, so in this area, I take those 16 values and do the computation. So for example, if this is the point for which I want to compute my interpolation, how do I do that? The first thing I can do, I, I want to compute this value over here as an interpolation of those two points, of both th four points, sorry. Then do the same here for this point among those four points, for this point, for those two points, for this one, for those two points. And then I do an interpolation between those points. Okay, so what I do is I take into account all the values which are circled in black and do an interpolation on the intensity values along this line, but I'm actually computing only this value over here. So I compute this kind of um, temporary variable, temporary value that I want to compute. Then do the same in here. I compute this value and I store it. And I go here, compute this value and store it. I go here, compute this value and store it. Now I have my four values along the correct row that I have here. And then I do the interpolation step in here and compute exactly this value over here. And I can express this exactly in the same way I express the bilinear or bilinear um, interpolation, except that the sum that I computed now goes up to, the, up to three values of i and j. Of course, in theory, I need to go to whatever, from minus two to two, um, and compute the, the corresponding, no, sorry, go from zero to three, but I need to make sure that um, I do that for a point which lies in this segment. And then, I again, have my coefficients, which I can derive exactly in the same way as we've done this for the bilinear interpolation, and then have the delta uh, x and delta y value with different exponents, so up to um, the order of three in this case. And this to be given me a smoother and much better interpolation of the intensity values. So just as an example, the nearest neighbor interpolation, bilinear interpolation by cubic interpolation, what we have seen. So again, these black dots are those values for which I know the color information. This is yellow, yellow, blue, dark blue, red, red, cyan, red, and so on. If I do the nearest neighbor approach, I would fill all the areas in between in exactly the same color as the closest element, the, the closest element take. If I take the bilinear, inter bilinear interpolation into account, I just take my four neighbors and then do my interpolation. Or I do the bicubic interpolation, which now gives me actually nice and smooth um, boundaries in here, which interpolates taking into account 16 neighbors. And this is typically the high quality um, interpolation that we use if you want to have highly accurate results of the, in this resampling process. So just as a comparison, of course, nearest neighbor has the advantage that it is extremely fast, but the quality is typically not very good. For the bilinear interpolation, the speed is fine, quality is often sufficient, depending on how much I actually scale my image and how many, so how many actual values do I have and how much do the intensity values actually differ. Or the B-cubic interpolation, which can be slow for computing it but which gives me the highest, the best result. Just kind of again the zoomed in view, this was the interpolation using the nearest neighbor. This was my um, bilinear interpolation. We can here see at those borders, we have those kind of hard changes in the direction, which I may not want to have. And if I want to have a real smooth reconstruction, then this is actually the shape that I would use. And now we can actually use this if we do transformations between images and see, well, I want to illustrate how those different transformations actually change the output of an image. So this, 
a potentially a little bit hard to see on the projector. So this is an image where the interpolation is done with bilinear interpolation and here it's done with B-cubic interpolation. And what you can see is you have certain structures so in, in certain areas like this, this dark areas over here you basically don't see any difference. But they're kind of these small distinct structures or curved structures like this one over here where you see difference. So what do you see, hopefully see in here that you have kind of this black, black bright or dark bright, dark bright pattern that actually pops up here which is nearly completely gone with the bicubic interpolation and also the spike of the wheel um, he always has this kind of black white pattern which comes that in the neighborhood there are black pixels which then have a strong influence on this diagonally um, diagonal um, sp um, spike and this is kind of completely gone in here so this is the more high quality um, estimate and typically leads to better results than the bilinear interpolation and of course much better than the nearest neighbor approach. So are there any questions about this process so far? <laughs>